Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Midtown Scholar Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Alex Brubaker. I'm the manager here at the Scholar. And as always, I am live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania at the bookstore. Whether you're joining us on Crowdcast or Facebook Live or even YouTube Live, hope you're safe. Hope you're hanging in there. Thanks so much for tuning in. Welcome to our live stream series where we host authors and we keep the conversation going about books we love. Our featured book this evening is To Wake the Giant, a novel of Pearl Harbor. If you haven't yet purchased the book, I'd like to encourage you to do so. If you have the means, we are including signed book plates from Jeff with each and every book. And all these books are first editions if you're into collecting. Purchasing Jeff's book through us helps support the author, our staff, and this event series. It helps and it helps keep us going. Uh, we're even offering free media mail shipping in the US for a limited time to make the price more reasonable for you. So if you click the green button below, it's just right below my face, uh, it will direct you to our website to purchase a new copy of Jeff's book. If you're watching this through Facebook Live or YouTube Live, just look in the comments section and you should see we've provided a link there as well, or simply head to midtownscholar.com and thank you for your support. Now this evening, we are honored to welcome New York Times best-selling author Jeff Shara and WITF's Tim Lambert to virtual Harrisburg. Tim Lambert has been with WITF since August 2001. He was promoted to the position of multimedia news director in January 2011. He gets up at zero dark 30 to help listeners start their day as a morning edition host. He is a five-time recipient of the Radio Television Digital News Association's National Edward Murrow Award for Excellence in Digital and Broadcast Journalism and serves as one of four national coaches for the Trusting News Project. Tim's reporting has also been honored on the state, regional, and national levels. He is a graduate of the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Of course, our author this evening is Jeff Shara. He is the New York Times bestselling author of The Fateful Lightning, The Smoke at Dawn, A Chain of Thunder, A Blaze of Glory, and many, many more novels, as well as Gods and Generals and The Last Full Measure, two novels that complete the Civil War trilogy that began with his father's Pulitzer Prize winning classic, The Killer Angels. Shara was born into a family of Italian immigrants in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and he grew up in Tallahassee, Florida, and graduated from Florida State University. Jeff's new book that we are here for today, of course, again, is titled To Wake the Giant, which is the first novel of a gripping new series set in World War II's Pacific Theater. Now, a quick note before I hand it over to Tim and Jeff, uh, we think the best part about these events is audience interaction. So even though we're not in person, we still want you involved. Uh, if you have a question for Jeff, please use the ask a question button. Again, it's below my face uh, to submit your question. So get those questions in. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming onto the screen, Tim Lambert and Jeff Shara. Good evening. Good evening. Jeff, it's great to uh, talk to you again. Uh, talked to you in 1996 when I was just a young reporter in uh, Gettysburg and Gods and Generals was released. So uh, it's good to come full circle with you here. That was, yeah, that was a lifetime ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, it was. Um, let's start off with uh, the historical novel. Um, just for folks joining us, what makes it different from a nonfiction history book? Well, what makes mine, I can really only speak for myself. Uh, you know, I had a historian tell me one time, why do you care about researching? You can do anything you want. Are you writing a novel? You can make stuff up. Um, I mean, literally make stuff up. I don't do that. Uh, it, to me, and I, I don't know why I'm this way, but to me, it's really important to get it right, get the facts straight. So the history is accurate. The, the events, the dates, the timeline, and the characters are real people. Um, by definition, though, what makes my work fiction is that there's dialogue. You're in the heads of the characters, so you're seeing things through their eyes. And that, by, that has to be called fiction. There's no way around that. But I'm fiercely proud of the historical accuracy of, of the books because, I mean, I know how much research I do. I know how much time it takes and how I'll read 30 to 40 books or more for every book that I write. Um, so that's the biggest part of it is getting, you know, get it right. Don't mess around with history. So other authors, you know, writing novels can certainly do anything they want. Um, but that's, I take a, maybe a little bit of a different approach. Now, Alec mentioned your father's book, the classic uh, Killer Angels, about the Battle of Gettysburg. When you began your first book, Gods and Generals, did you try to adhere to his writing style, or did you try to have your own approach right off the bat? I don't know that I did either one, because I had never done this before. I didn't know how to write. Um, and I remember literally sitting down and looking at the computer screen with, you know, page one, this blank page, and laughing. 
Like, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> um, and I and, uh, and seriously though, when people ask, when people make the observation that they read Killer Angels and they read Gods and Generals or vice versa, and it seemed, I love this word, it's seamless. Um, I, what a fabulous compliment that is. I mean, my father was a Pulitzer Prize winning author and I, there's no competition here. I mean, I'm, I'm honored to be in the same court with him. But at the same time, I think whose writing has influenced me more than anybody's in my life. Um, it was my sister who read the manuscript of Gods and Generals and said, this is being written by the ghost of our father. Wow. And, and, you know, and again, you, I don't think you can pretend. I don't think you can set out with, you know, whether you want to copy Hemingway or, you know, Herman Melville or whoever it might be. That doesn't work because it takes so much energy to copy, you know, to try to follow somebody else's style you don't have a story. So I just wrote the way it came out and I've been doing that ever since. And when, when you had the success of your first book, were you, and you hadn't done it before, and all of a sudden you had this success, were you sort of like, hey, this might be a thing here? <laughs> no, oh no, I was terrified. Because first of all, I knew every, I mean, the publisher sent me out with Gods and Generals on a 59 city book signing tour, um, and, you know, to introduce me, and, you know, not Michael Shara, this is the son. Well, I mean, I'm going around the country and these people are coming to bookstores and they want to hear what I have to say and they're buying my book and they want my signature. This was all brand new stuff. And I was fully convinced that people wanted more of the Killer Angels. I mean, I was being cut huge slack by the critics um, because people were rooting for this to work because they liked the Killer Angel. They didn't want to see me fall on my face which is a really nice thing. The problem with that is Gods and Generals comes and goes, spends 15 weeks on the bestseller list. Now it's time to write the sequel. Now there's an expectation in New York, you know, my publisher, and now people are waiting for the next book. And all of now I'm, I am terrified because now I know that people are, you know, they want to see if I'm going to fall on my face. Um, so I take a certain amount of pride that this, you know, that, that To Wake the Giant is my 17th book. And if this one falls on my face, well, okay, but it's been a pretty good run. <laughs> so, so how did your writing style, I guess, evolve from book one to book 17 now? Well, I have to say a lot of people, and, and I know people will disagree with me on this, a lot of people have told me they think Gods and Generals is my best book. Well, that's very nice. I appreciate the compliment. I don't agree. I read Gods and Generals now, and I see all the ways I could make it a better book that if I was writing it today, it would be better. I mean, I, I'm convinced of that. So I think, I hope the way it works is you evolve. Anyone, who, I don't care if you're an auto mechanic or whatever you are, the more you do it, the better you get, I hope. That's the way it works. And in my case, I'm, a, I'm much more confident when I sit down to write a book that I think I know what I'm doing, that I think I know how to make the story happen and how to find the characters, whereas, you know, 24 years ago, I had no idea. I mean, I was fumbling through the whole process. So I think if nothing else, it's experience. I hope that's what it is. So how do you decide on a topic for each book then? Well, it, there's a lot of interaction between me and my publisher. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, I mean, I'll have ideas that I want to do and they don't want me to do them. I mean, I get a good example of the War of 1812. Uh, when I finished my Rev War series, I thought that was the next logical step, and they said, no, it's not epic enough. That's a line they've used a lot to me, Spanish-American <laughs> War, um, the, the French and Indian War. So that's never happened. Uh, and my, what I've said many times is if, if they're not going to print it, there's not much point in me writing it. Um, that could change uh, as my contracts expire and so forth. But um, the, the, the topics, I mean, it has to be, Something, first of all, that appeals to me, but doesn't appeal to me, it's going to be a lousy book. And finding the characters, because, and I have to say, all of my books are not, none of them are event driven. They're character driven. They're about people. And when I find the people, you know, the characters who are cool, it doesn't matter what the era is. I mean, I can pick out characters from everywhere from the you know, American Revolution to the Korean War um, and everywhere in between. And it's those characters that make the book to me, to make it appealing to me. It's my job to make it appealing to you. So how do you settle on those characters that are going to be telling the story throughout? That's the hardest part. I'll, you know, when I start doing the research, the first thing I do is read the history, get the facts straight, you know, get the timeline straight, um, know who was where and what they were doing. 
But then it's, I have to find the voices. And someone said, another author I've talked to said that, that he felt like the voices found him. Okay, I mean, that sounds good. But I mean, it's a question of who is, first of all, who's appropriate to the story. To find some cool guy who doesn't really do anything, or doesn't really add anything to the book. So you need to find those people who are in the right place at the right time, um, who can add to the story. And then they have to be interesting. If they're not interesting, if I'm not interested in these people, why would you be interested? So it just doesn't work. And you pick characters who are well known and characters uh, who nobody knows anything about and you tell their story. Um, is that important for you to, to just not always focus on the so-called historical figures? Oh, definitely. Um, one of the things my father did with the Killer Angels is he focuses on the top down. I mean, he, so you talk about generals. Everything, everything is about generals. And when I, and I did the same thing. And then when I got up to about the First World War, I realized that doesn't work anymore. The generals are back there. They're, you know, 10 miles behind the line. You need that kid out there with the rifle in his hand um, looking into the guns of the enemy. That's where the good story is. So that changed the entire way I wrote. From that point on, whether it was World War II, and then I went back to Civil War and did the four-book series in the West, you had those characters, the unknown, the people you never heard of. Um, and in many cases, most cases, they're composite characters. Everything happened. Everything's real. Um, it just may not have happened to one person, the way I portray it. Um, but all the way through this process, the historical figures, the people who matter, the people who are in the history books, uh, boy, it's important to get that right because people care. You know, if I start fudging Dwight Eisenhower or Black Jack Pershing or Ulysses Grant or George Washington, you know, and I start playing games with those characters or I don't get it right, you're going to let me know because people care. So, you know, knowing, I mean, that's a responsibility that I'm accepting. Somebody said to me, I've said this many times, somebody said to me once, how dare you put words in the mouth of Robert E. Lee? Okay, challenge accepted. If I dare to put the words in the mouth of Lee, they better be the right words because people like that will just blast me for it. So, you know, accepting that responsibility, all that means is do your homework, get it right. Uh, we'll get to the Pearl Harbor book in just a minute, but I did want to ask you about, you know, you've, you've written these books on different conflicts and different eras, um, Civil War, World War II, the Revolutionary War. What are the challenges in terms of, of research and trying to capture that particular era in different styles of warfare, I guess? The farther back you go, the less material there is, simply put. Uh, when you get up to, I mean, and that for me is Red War. Uh, I mean, I happen to have a first edition of Light Horse Harry Lee's memoir. He was he was the Jeb Stewart of the American Revolution. Uh, and I have Lafayette's memoir published in 1825. And he was there. And that is crucial to me to have those kinds of Cornwallis's letters, you know, I mean, to have that kind of material. But there's not a lot of it. And you get up to Civil War and it expands exponentially. And then you get up to World War Two and it expands again. And it almost gets to a point where you've got an embarrassment of riches. I mean, there's like so much research you can do. At some point, you have to stop. I mean, at some point, you have to find the story. And, and okay, because you could be researching the rest of your life with World War II or with the Civil War. I would imagine that happened with Pearl Harbor. I mean, there's just so many, there are so many books written about it, so much information out there. Um, what was the process of, of starting this book and, and going through that research process? Well, when you've got all those different battleships in Pearl Harbor, that, you know, that some of them get seriously damaged and some get you know minor damage okay you can write a story about every one of them and you can find a sailor on every one there are uh, you know medal of honor recipients uh, all over the place out there and, and not all of them are sailors some of them are army some of them are marines um so there's i mean there's ten thousand stories i could write or forty thousand for the number of troops that were there um so that's okay i gotta back away from that i mean i you know pick something go with it try to find the story, uh, and not just Pearl Harbor, but then you've got Washington, then you've got Japan. Uh, so you've got, the, you know, you've got the conflicting points of view uh, and how it evolved. And one thing I have to say about this book, Pearl Harbor, bombs falling on ships, that lasts two hours. Well, if I do nothing but bombs falling on ships, after, I mean, that's going to get old, and that's not going to really be the story. Well, 
So this book is a year long. And it starts, and I hope it doesn't take a year to read it, but uh, it starts in December of 1940 and then goes to December of 1941. It's because you get the background. You get what happened, why, who these people are, what are the screw-ups, and there are loads of them, and, you know, what people knew what was happening or didn't know, thought they knew, didn't know, um, and then what was, you know, what was the planning, what was going on, and then the kid, you know, Tommy Biggs, the 19-year-old on the Arizona, you know, he's a new kid to the Navy, he escapes the Depression by joining the Navy, he finds out he's, he's it's his dream to be on a battleship, that's every, so everybody joins the Navy, that's what they want, they all want to be on a battleship, he gets it, he gets on the USS Arizona, that is so cool, he goes to Hawaii, he's on the Arizona for a while, and then the story of what happens to him and the people around him is a big part of the story. Uh, I'll, you know, disclose that I haven't been able to read the entire book yet. I've gotten about 130, 140 pages in. But one part I did come across was in April of 1941, when the president read a report compiled by two U.S. military avi aviation experts that basically lays out exactly what would happen months later on December 7, 1941. Um, the Martin Bellinger report, what was it? What did it say? And why was it ignored the way it was? Yeah, Martin, Martin Bellinger is an army and a, uh, and a Navy guy, you know, a high ranking officers. Um, they put this report together kind of based on what they're sort of eyeballing with the Japanese and what they think the Japanese militarism is happening, and what our preparations are in Hawaii, which are not very good. And, and they put this report together. And it's, I mean, it's, it's in the book. And there's a scene, there's FDR, and you've got uh, Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War, and you've got George Marshall, this Chief of Staff, and on and on and on, and Frank Knox, the Secretary of the Navy, as well as Cordell Hull, who's my character. He's, he's the eyes. You see this, but he's the Secretary of State. And they read this report, and it's like, well, that's pretty interesting. But uh, now remember, this is April of 41. Nothing's really happened, uh, except the Japanese are, are, you know, in China. Raking, raising havoc there, um, and the wars in Europe, and it's all about Germany. So they read this thing, and it's like, well, yeah, okay, this is fine, but um, okay, next topic. And part of that, you, you know, you can call it willful ignorance or whatever you want, you can call it culpable criminality, and you know, I've heard all of that stuff. What it is, is first of all, a big part of it is racism. We do not believe the Japanese have the capability of doing anything like this. The idea that, and I put quotes throughout the book, uh, like it's section beginnings and so forth. Uh, this is a real quotes, real people, and you know, famous people who say things like, well, you know, Japanese can't fly a plane. I mean, they are, they're born with inner ear problems and they, they, they don't have the, you know, the, they can't keep a, a, a gyroscopes in, in their own head. So we don't have to worry about them flying. Their planes fall out of the sky in 10 minutes. I mean, they can't build a decent airplane. In fact, they have the Japanese Zero, which is for a couple of years, is the finest fighting plane in the world. We don't know that. So it's really interesting to look at the racial, the racism part of this. And the other, you know, the thing I, I only briefly want to touch on this, when you have hindsight, which we have, and when you had hindsight, you know, from 1942 all the way to now, uh, the hindsight starts out saying, you know, they should have known. Okay. And then that evolves into how could they not know? And that evolves into they knew. Now, when you start pinning the blame like that on people like FDR or in George Marshall or the admirals in Hawaii, they, they must have known. They didn't. Right. And, that's, and that's what this story is about. Yeah, it's uh, it's almost as if the red flags that were there, uh, there was enough, there were enough people up the chain of command who decided that those weren't really red flags. That's right. Yeah. That's right. The other thing too, there's a myth. The myth is the, the magic intercepts that we had broken the Japanese military codes, and so we're reading their mail. I mean, we know what's going to happen in advance. Uh, uh We broke the diplomatic codes. Magic breaks the diplomatic code, the purple code, the Japanese call it. Um, so we knew what the what their what their consulates were saying to their embassies and what their you know what their foreign minister was saying back and forth. We knew all of that. That had nothing to do with what was going to happen at Pearl Harbor. 
And that's a, a myth that is unfortunate in the way it's been sort of twisted around historically. We didn't know. And even right up into the you know minutes, hours before the actual attack, there were warning signs that were ignored. Um, I'll mention Joe Lockhart because he was from Dauphin County, Pennsylvania here, and he's in your book. He's a, he's a, a radar operator who sees a large blip coming in of, of aircraft. And, and uh, you know, he, he what happened with his report that this was happening? Well, I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, it's, you know, radar is a brand new technology. And these kids, and Lockhart's one of them, um, they're out there at Opana Radar Station on the north coast of, of Oahu, out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, they're sitting in this little shack, and they're you know looking at this radar, and their shift is up, and it's Sunday morning, and it's 7 o'clock, and they want to go home, and they want breakfast, and you know we want to get coffee. And all of a sudden, this thing shows up on this oscilloscope, this big green screen. They've never seen anything like that before. They don't know what that is. They've never seen a plane on an oscilloscope before. And so the other the two guys in there looking at this and say, well, what do you think? I don't know. And it's probably not birds. No. So they call it in. They call to the, the central area where this one guy, a lieutenant, just happens to be there by, by chance. He gets the phone call from them and he knows that 17 or the, a number, I think it's 21, B-17s are coming into Hawaii from the mainland, from California. And he knows they're supposed to be there that morning. He assumes that that's what that is, that they're seeing on the radar screen. So he told, tells them, quote, don't worry about it. Well, again, did these guys get hanged, you know, for what they did? No. And thankfully, I mean, there's some justice there. They didn't know. They had no reason to believe that it was a hundred and some odd Japanese planes bearing down on them. Why would they know that? So how do you go about telling the story then of the bombing in the in the last part of the book? Um, a story that's been told, you know, many times, but how do you make that personal? How do you make that part of, you know, the appeal of, of what you've written so far up to that point? Well, there are, you're, now see, you're going to make me give away a whole bunch of the book here. Uh, we don't have to do that. No spoilers. <laughs> see, and I don't mind doing that. My wife gets mad at me and says, well, stop giving away the book. Well, I think um, we know how it ends, right? I mean, you've got, first of all, you've got the Japanese side. I mean, they're launching the planes off the carriers, you know, a couple hundred miles north of Oahu. And so you've got Minora Genda, who is the, he's the Billy Mitchell of, of the Japanese air uh, people. I mean, he, he's the guy who figures out how to launch an air attack. This is all new stuff. Nobody has ever launched a massive air attack on any place before. So, he, you know, he, he figures out how to do this. Well, he's on the aircraft carrier when they take off. You talk about emotional for him. I mean, he's watching these planes one at a time, you know, off they go. Um, having no idea if he's ever going to see them again. So there's that. There's, I mentioned, well, there's the Admiral, uh, Husband Kimmel. Who names their kid Husband? I, I, don't, I don't know, but that, that's his name, Husband Kimmel. And, you know, he's the Admiral when, the, when things start to fall apart at Pearl Harbor. He's at home. He's getting ready to play golf, you know, with, with the, uh, General Short, who's the Army commander. They're getting ready to go out and play golf like they do every weekend. And he, somebody's yelling, he hears racket and there's a phone call and he goes outside and he sees what's happening. He sees this, you know, the bombs going off, the planes going by. And he's, uh, he's whisked away to his office at, you know, at the headquarters. And in the process of this, this is historically true. In the process of that, a spent, he's looking out the window with his staff and all these people. A spent shell comes through the glass and hits him in the chest and flops on the floor. And he bends down and picks it up and he's looking at it. And someone says, oh, you know, oh my God, that was a close call. And he, he says, you know, it, it would have been better if it had killed me. And wow. he knew right there what his future was going to be. He's supposed to know. Finally, the, the character who means the most to me, and that's Tommy Biggs, the 19-year-old on the Arizona. A lot of people don't know you know, the Arizona goes down with a horrific loss of life. 1,100 people die when that ship goes down. But 335 of them survive. And a lot of people are not aware of that. Uh, I will say this. When I began working on this book, and I say this in the afterward, when I began working on this book, there were six of those survivors were still alive. Today, there are two. Wow. Um, and there's no telling... You know, a week from now, two weeks from now, a month from now, there's going to be none. Um, that 
adds enormous sentiment. Well, first of all, it adds enormous emotion to me to get it right. And also to tell their story because when they're gone, they can't tell their story. It's up to us. So that's that's one of the things that drives me to write these books. And we'll get to uh, questions here in a second. Um, I guess one of my, my final question would be, you, you wrote a book that you, you say in the book has become very personal to you. Can you share with us that journey from, you know, sitting down and starting to write it, beginning the research, and then getting to the point where sometimes you might have to walk away from the computer or the keyboard because it's too much for you, it's too emotional? How did that, how did that play out? One of the men I just mentioned who has recently passed away, his name is Don Stratton, and he wrote a book about his accounts. And I know Dan Martinez, who I mentioned, the book is dedicated to Dan Martinez. He's the chief historian at Pearl Harbor. He is a prince of a human being. He, he has been so helpful to me. He and Don Stratton were good friends right up until the end of Stratton's life. And Dan has interviewed countless veterans, survivors, civilians, people who were there, and, and archived the video. We go into the visitor center there, the museum, go see it. They're all right there and they talk to you. That's phenomenal. So I had that sort of as my ammunition and I'm doing this work. And then of course, um, I start talking to people around here in Philadelphia um, and they knew people who, you know, are families and they have someone. And the, so the more, it's sort of, I'm very lucky because it, it sort of expands. It's like an accordion going out and I begin to receive things from people and some people don't want to talk. And if somebody doesn't want to talk, it's not up to me to push their buttons. I'm very careful about that. But when they do want to talk, holy cow, because never, never do they talk and not tear up every time. Mm. And, you know, and Dan Martinez knows this better than anybody because he's talked to way more of them than I have. But, you know, this goes back to my last book on Korea. Um, in my living room, sat Pete Sanders. Pete Sanders was a member of, of you know, Charlie Company, Charlie One Five, you know, the 5th, 5th uh, Marine Regiment, uh, you know, in, in, at the Chosin Reservoir. He was there. And he sits in my living room and he starts out by saying he's a family friend of my wife's family. And he says to me, ask me anything you want, but don't ask me about my friends. Fair enough. You know, I mean, he's going to spill his guts to me. He doesn't need to go there. And I totally respected that. Well, Pete gave, gave me, I call it tidbits. And that's a, a tr too trivial a word. But he gave me little pieces that I can put in the story to add authenticity. And anybody who was there um, will know that. Oh, you know, they wrapped their feet, their frostbitten feet in, in straw. Uh, you know, rice straw. That's what they had in Korea. And you know, little things like that that don't mean much to the, the average person reading the story. But it'll mean something to the guy who was there. And Pete, you know, when the book came out, uh, The Frozen Hours, when that came out, I gave him the first copy, and there was an American Legion thing, giving him a celebration. And he and that was very cool. He was emotional. I was emotional. My wife was emotional. Um, and then about six months later, he passed away. Yeah. And so there you go. There's another one, you know, a fabulous source of incredible information. And he's gone. All right, we're going to open it up for questions. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add that I didn't ask you at all before we uh, open it up? No, I, I, uh, I you know, I, I, we all know why we're here. You know, and, and normally tomorrow morning when the book comes out officially on May 19th, um, I would be um, I'm getting on a plane flying to start my tour. Uh, there's no tour this year. And so we're doing this, which is great. Um, and I'm so clueless to two months. Months ago, I didn't know this kind of technology even existed. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is terrific. Uh, but if this helps, you know, reach people and, and if people um, will find this book to be something they're interested in, then I've done my job. And and, I, and much of what I just said, um, then I'm doing these guys justice because somebody's got to. They can't do it for themselves. All right, well said. Um, so the first question, out of all the books you've written, which one was the most demanding to write? Whew, probably my World War I book, To the Last Man. 
And the, the simple reason for that, my publisher, it, it should have been two books. I wanted to do a two volume set of World War I, uh, the Flying Ace story, uh, the Lafayette Escadrille, the Red Baron, and then you have Pershing and the Marines, and you know, sort of tie the two together. My publisher did not think there was an audience for two books on World War I, so they made me combine it. So now it's one book. And so it, it's my longest book, and, and it, it, they, they're crafty the way they put thin paper in there, so you can't really tell it. It's, it's not <laughs> much longer than the rest of the books. But that was hard because it, it really is two separate books, and it's, so it's two separate sets of research. I mean, it's, it's two entirely different stories. But it won an award, and you know, I, so I, I guess it worked. Uh, personally, I've, uh, I haven't read all your books, but I've read a lot of them, and that was my favorite. I thought that was outstanding uh, portrayal of the First World War. Um, so what makes writing about American history so exciting for you? Well, again, as, as I said before, it's not about the event. Um, I, I'm not psyched up about events. If I was, I'd be a historian. I mean, I'd be writing nonfiction. It's about the people. It's about finding those voices that are in the middle of some of the most fantastic events that ever occurred, not just in this country, but in the world. And I mean, when you find those voices and they speak, and I don't mean to sound mystical or anything, but when those voices speak to me, then if I'm doing my job, I can make them speak to you. And you know, we all link together on this. So um, it's, again, it's not about the event, it's finding those people. Uh, Elizabeth Bates has a question. From start to finish, how long did it take for you to write this book? It takes me about, first of all, about six months of research. Now, see, I'll, I'll, let me preface this by saying, I mean, I meet guys who take, my father took seven years to write The Killer Angels because he had a day job. Um, I am extremely fortunate, and I'm also, I think, rare when it comes to writers, that I do this full time. Um, this is what I do. Uh, so when I'm researching or writing, it's seven days a week. And uh, the research, about six months, the writing, about another five to six months. So it's, it's a full year. Um, and I got, I've, I've gotten criticism for that, from, particularly from historians. Guys work 10 years on his book about something. How can you write a book in a year? You know, you're obviously taking shortcuts. The book will be the judge. Right. Uh, from Dale, do you have any plans of tying the new series into your older World War II novels, like The Final Storm? Um, I, that was a, it's a strange situation that I'm in now with that, and uh, to sort of fill in the blanks there, I did a trilogy on the war in Europe. Um, so it's, you know, it, it ends basically with the E-Day you know, in May of 1945. Well, I got grief from Marines, because the Marines aren't in Europe. They're, you know, that other war halfway around the world, and I said, okay, you know, they're right. And so I'm going to write the end of the war, the real end of the war, the summer of 1945 in the Pacific. So I did Okinawa and the bomb. Well, that tied together with the trilogy in Europe because of the characters. And I did that on purpose. But now it's like, oh, okay, now I'm starting all over again. So I'm not sure what to do about that. So I certainly will. The problem is, what do you do in the Pacific? Uh, you know, the, this book on Pearl Harbor is pretty obvious. Then you've got Midway is next, and that's not giving away anything. I'm, you know, that, that's an obvious sequel. But the problem then is what next? You can do Guadalcanal. That's four months. You know, every day is the same. The Marines get up, get chewed up. They, they you know, they, they chew up the Japanese, and then they next day they do it again. It's brutal. It's horrific. But I don't know what kind of a story I can make that. And then you got the island hopping. Well, every island, I mean, you know, Peleliu, Saipan, uh, Guam, Tinian, on and on and on, it's all the same story. The Marines stormed the beach, they get shot to pieces, they hunker down, the, the Japanese charge them a few times, get slaughtered, and then the Marines eventually wipe them out. That's the story of almost every island campaign in the Pacific. Um, so, you know, Okinawa was different, which is why I wanted to do that. But I don't really know what I'm going to do next after Midway, um, because... You know, I mean, unless I go completely out of bounds and do like Burma, um, do you know, do something like that, um, do the Leyte Gulf, which is another naval story, that's a possibility. I just don't know. And, and I will say this: I can't think about it because I, I I meet people that can write three or four books at a time. That would make my head explode. <laughs> I, I, I have to focus on the one book I'm doing at that moment, 
um, and, and I can't think ahead. So, so when does the work on Midway begin then? It already has. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've done most of the research, you know, because the thing is, I finished writing To Wake the Giant in, uh, in December. We edited it early in January, and then I was done. Um, and it's a little bit you know, like the just gestation period. Um, there's nothing for me to do between January and now uh, except go to work again. So that's what I've been doing. I've been doing an enormous amount of reading on Midway, trying to put, again, the same kind of thing, put the characters together for who they're going to be. And the nice thing about Midway for me is a lot of the characters are the same, uh, particularly on the Japanese side. So, it, it, you know, that, that helps a little bit. So the, the research isn't quite as long with doing a sequel like that. Okay. Um, from Joe, any plans for books, stories that will revisit the Civil War? There are a couple. I mean, I get that question a lot, actually. And I, I appreciate the fact that there are a lot of people out there who care about the Civil War. And, I, and they've been very good to me. And I, you know, But right now, I mean, the one story that jumps out at me is Franklin Nashville. I touch on it a little bit in the, the series of War in the West, but I don't take you there. Um, and so that that's one. Um, I could do the Trans-Mississippi or you know, Texas and so forth, but it's hard to find, hard for me to find a good story there. Um, there are a lot of little stories, and I hate to, I'm not being demeaning. I mean, there's Pea Ridge and there's Perryville, and those are great stories, but they're not epic, and my publisher wants epic. Um, but I think Franklin and, and Nashville could be epic. And so um, that's a possibility. I wanted to do the Alabama, the CSS Alabama, but that's a brief, that's too brief a story. And it doesn't end well for the Alabama. Um, so other than that, you know, I, I don't know. I'm open to ideas. What I, what I appreciate people that do, and, and thank you for this, but when people write me and say, you know, my great, great, great grandfather was in the 14th Illinois, and, you know, he was a really great guy. We've got pictures and letters. You should do his story. Well, yeah, I, I'm, I could probably, and uh, unfortunately, no, very few people outside your family would want to read it. Um, and so I, I try to stay away from stories like that, where I'm just picking one guy and following him. That's, that's not what I do, to take one guy and one character and follow him through his exploits through the war, whether it's World War II or whatever it is. That doesn't fit really my what I do. Uh, Janet wants to know, would you consider stepping away from an actual war setting and delve into something more civilian, for lack of a better term, something uh, such as 9-11 or the Challenger accident? Ooh, 9-11, uh, we've talked about, it's too too soon. I lived in New York. I, I don't want to do that story. Um, I, I don't go to 9-11. I don't go to Ground Zero. It's too personal for me, which might make it a better story. I don't know, but not not yet. Um, Challenger accident I actually saw out the window of my office. I mean, that, that's another strange one. I was in Tampa, 90 miles across the, the, uh, the body of Florida. The ones that, I mean, to answer your question, yes, there are some civilian stories, and that's not the right word for it. Lewis and Clark is one. It's been a long time since Undaunted Courage came out, Stephen Ambrose's version, which was nonfiction. Uh, to do that as a novel would be really interesting. There are others, the Klondike Gold Rush, um, the story which is primarily female-centered. I mean, the, what the women do in the Klondike is an incredible story, and almost nobody knows that story. That's one that I would love to do, and this goes back to my childhood when I was a big Elliot Ness and the Untouchables fan, um, which I know that dates me terribly, <laughs> Robert Stack as an Elliot Ness. But uh, I would love to do that kind of like a prohibition gangster kind of story, something you know, very, very different. Um, those are the, the more modern, the Gulf War, and I know that's war, but the, the, you know, the more modern you get, the more politics is involved. I hate politics. I don't want to do anything that involves, you know, making a statement one way or the other. I just don't do that. So the modern stories I probably would not do. But um, yeah, the earlier stuff, um, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely considering, I'll be doing this for a long time. So there, there's a, quite a few on the table. Uh, Todd had wanted to know, any thoughts on doing a book of, with uh, General Custer in the 7th? I'll, I'll tell you why that's a bad idea. Um, and I've had a lot of people suggest that. If I portray Custer in sort of a positive light, that's politically incorrect these days. 
I'll get just throttled for that. Um, if, on the other hand, I portray Sitting Bull as the good guy, and the you know the, US, the cavalry is the bad guy, nobody will want to read the book, and I'll get blasted for that too. It's a no-win situation unless I'm so mamby pamby, you know, right down the fence on it, and that's not what I want to do. So I'm for now. I'm just going to keep that idea in the background. <laughs> Uh, Angela wants to know, have you ever researched a character and then started writing and discovered something new about them? Yeah, uh, there's two. Uh, the, the most prominent one is Phil Sheridan. When I did The Last Full Measure, the last pivotal scenes in that book involved Appomattox. And not Appomattox Courthouse, I mean, not, not the, the meeting between Grant and Lee. Before that, when you've got Lee's army is destroyed. I mean, there are 25,000 men there are 8,000 rifles. I mean, they have no way to fight anything. They are completely out of gas. Sheridan is in command of the field at Appomattox. He has 70,000 troops. He has Lee's army surrounded on three sides. He wants to attack. Now, Grant, this is all historically accurate. Grant rides up. Grant's been lickety split across the countryside uh, because he's going to meet with Lee. And he rides up and Sheridan says, we're ready to go. Well, come on, we're, we're, sir, give, me, give the order and we're ready to go. And Grant says, what do you mean? He says, well, sir, we've got him. You know, Grant says, I'm going to meet with Lee. Have you not heard that there's an armistice? And Sheridan says, it's a rebel trick. And Grant says, why don't we go to meet with Lee and find out if it's a rebel trick? Well, what I concluded from that, I was going to write that chapter from Sheridan's point of view. What I concluded is, had Grant not shown up when he did, and even five minutes later, Sheridan would have ordered the attack. He would have slaughtered Lee's army, and he would have gone down and hit, and our history is the worst butcher we ever produced. And what would that have done to Reconstruction and to, you know, the relationship between North and South today? Well... I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm being over, overly dramatic about this, but it's true. I mean, this is, well, when I realized that with the, re, the research, and this was from Grant's, you know, memoir and, and other people who were there, I hated Sheridan. I don't want to tell that story through this guy's eye. I can't get in his head. I didn't like him at all. Hmm. And so, he, so that chapter is written from the point of view of Joshua Chamberlain, who's also there. Um, but so there, that was the, probably the most vivid example I can come of a character who just, uh-uh, you know, I, it made sense historically to use him. Can't do it. <laughs> I'm curious then, why? what was it about Sheridan that you were just like, meh, nope, not doing it? Well, the fact that his, that level of viciousness, not taking into account what his enemy was, the fact that you've got, you know, you've got 8,000 effective troops, uh, and, and a bunch of other guys sitting around who haven't eaten in three days or four days, um, and you're just going to attack them. To what end? I mean, the, the only thing that's going to come out of that is slaughter. Why? You know, so, I, yeah, that just turned me off to the guy so much, I just I couldn't write the chapter. Uh, any advice for aspiring writers? Quite a few. I mean, I, I get a lot through my website. Um, people will ask me things, and, uh, you know, People will have an idea, and they'll say, here's an idea I have. You need to write this. So, uh -uh, it's your idea. You know, the first thing you have to do, my father, I'm quoting my father a lot here because he taught creative writing at Florida State. And some of the things he would say to his students, you know, if, you have an, if you're not passionate or if you don't care about the story you're trying to tell, why would I care? You know, write something you care about. Right? So, well, I don't care if it's your grandfather, your dog, your next door neighbor, whatever it is, if it's something that appeals to you, then it might appeal to me. But if it's not going to, if it's just some, you know, some idea you think will sell, I hate hearing that. Um, it, it's not good. Um, you know, other things like, you know, show it, don't tell it. Uh, one of the greatest compliments I ever heard for the Killer Angels came in a review where somebody said, for the first time, I felt like I knew what the Civil War smelled like. What a compliment that is. And that's the point. If you're going to tell the story, don't just tell. Well, he went over here and he did that, and he climbed over this tree, and then he did that. No, take me with you. You know, let's go. You know, put me on the ground. That's my job when I'm writing always. You know, when, I, when I, I'm going up the hill with the kid with the rifle in his hands into the guns of the enemy, 
first of all, I've been on that hill. That's the first part of it. Go there, walk the ground. But the other part, you know, I have to take me. I'm going up the hill, not this character I'm making up. You're coming with me. And that's how you be a writer, because it's that link right there between the guy writing the words and the person reading them. They've got to be together. Um, and please don't ever ask me what's the secret to writing a bestseller, because there isn't one. Um, if that's your motivation going in, d don't bother, because there is no secret. Um, uh, I guarantee you, you know, J.K. Rowling had no idea what was going to happen with Harry Potter. It wasn't she had some gimmick. It just happened. It took off. I am very fortunate about that, but, you know, there, it's not some game we play. I mean, uh, there's not some formula. Right? You know, people say, oh, I don't know how to write. Neither did I. You know, sit down and, I mean, how do you know you don't know how to write? Sit down and write. Then you'll find out. But let somebody else make that determination. You put the words on the paper. You put the story you want to tell. Let somebody else figure out if you can write or not. Just do it. So, that, you know, that, that's a lot of preachiness, but um, it applies. So how do you balance the professional life as a full-time uh, author and the uh, family life? Oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here literally 20 feet from my family. <laughs> 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 uh, they're, you know, they're making dinner. Um, and, you know, I mean, my, my daughter, uh, again, going back to the, the virus and thing, and my daughter's a student at Temple University. She's here. I mean, she's you know, in Temple. There's nobody. There's, there's a Temple right now. Um, and uh, actually, right here in this area, we're in sort of a hot spot in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of nasty. So there's a lot of staying home. So even if that's not the case, I mean, you know, my daughter would come in because she's not at UCLA, which we thought about trying to send her out there. Um, she can come home on the train, you know. And so uh, we are close. I mean, we do a lot of things together. My wife and I are restoring a home in Gettysburg right now called Red Patch. It is on the Gettysburg battlefield. How cool is that? Um, there's cannons in the front yard. Uh, <laughs> I bet you don't have cannons in the front yard. So, but we're, the house is a little bit of a wreck, and we're, we're fixing that up right now. And you can actually look. And my wife put a, uh, there's a Facebook page for the house, Red Patch in Gettysburg. <laughs> Um, so we're going to show like the progress as this goes. It'll be about six months. But uh, so, you know, we're doing that together and we do a lot uh, of that kind of, we travel together, the three of us. Um, and, um, it's, and well, we are three pets. So we have two basset hounds and a cat. So <laughs> we're one big happy family. <laughs> uh, Mark Jensen wants to know, how do you find a publishers these days? And what advice do you have for negotiating with them besides getting a good lawyer? <laughs> Well, first of all, no, forget the lawyer. You need an agent. No publisher, no large publisher that I know of, no reputable publisher, will accept a manuscript that does not come first through the hands of a literary agent. That's your first challenge. You know, there's guys on there's online sites you can look to find agencies, and those guys will be sort of the judge of whether or not they want to spend any time you know, on your behalf, uh, whether you can write or not, or they like your story. And it's going to be a, a frustrating and I will say this, and, and because I get the question all the time, who my agent is, uh, and, you know, like I would give out the name, I don't have one. Uh, I am one of a very small number of writers who never has used an agent. Uh, my father, with the Killer Angels, that's how I got my foot in the door, representing his estate. Uh, you know, Killer Angels is the number one bestseller. Well, that kind of, <laughs> the publisher takes my phone call. Um, that worked wonders for me. It's not going to work for everybody else. Um, it's a tough one. Just to go out and find a publisher is almost impossible. However, these days you can self-publish, and that's not. It, it, they used to have a stigma, like you know, self-publishing is for losers. You know, no, not anymore. It really is not. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't turn your nose up at that. A lot of people do, um, but check it out. You know, it, it's. A lot of people are selling books right now that are doing it themselves through Amazon or through you know some of these other self-publishing sites. Don't don't ignore that. Uh, Mimi asked, any thoughts on writing about the Vietnam War? I do want to do Vietnam. I get all. I mean, that's my era, and I get a lot of input from Vietnam vets. So many ideas. Uh, the problem there is you got a 15-year war, and. So, and I talked about politics earlier. The story I would not do 
is the Nixon, LBJ, McNamara, Westmoreland story. I don't want to do the politics. It's an ugly story. So it would be a little, what, what, I hate the word, but it, it's a little story, you know, out there in the bush, you know, out there, you know, chasing Charlie in the bush is a line from, from Apocalypse Now. Um, it would have to be that kind of a story, and maybe more than one. Um, and, and I've heard from, oh, from Marines, I've heard from the Brown Water Navy guys, uh, on and on and on, uh, POW, um, you know, who's in the Hanoi Hilton. Um, there's a story. Um, so it's, yeah, I do want to do it. I just don't know what it will be yet. Uh, R.J. Martin Burns wants to know if you're going to watch the mini documentary of Grant next Monday on the History Channel. Probably not. Um, I've sort of done my own mini biography of Grant <laughs> a couple of times. I mean, nothing again. I mean, I think everybody out there knows that the History Channel is not what the History Channel started out to be. And that's, I, I hate saying that because I wish they were. Um, but, uh, you know, for that reason, maybe I'll check it out. And generally what happens is I wait and hear other people check it out and then I hear their comments, people I trust. Um, and then, you know, if they say it's really great, then okay, well, then I'll watch it. Is there one documentary building off that a little bit that, that you have watched that you think is fantastic and people should check out? Just about every, and I'm not, you know, sucking up the Ken Burns, but just about <laughs> everything Ken Burns has done. Um, I, I watched his Prohibition series, which was fabulous. Um, I mean, baseball, jazz, I mean, the whole, obviously, Civil War. But, I mean, whatever he does, when it comes out, I'm watching it. And I, I have, I've met Ken a few times. Um, I just sent him a book for his birthday. Uh, and it's, um, he's the top. He's the top guy. And, you know, as long as he's making them, I'll watch it. All right. Looks like uh, one more question. You mentioned the French and Indian War earlier. Do you have any future plans to do a book on the uh, lesser known history of uh, America? Yeah. I mean, first of all, I mean, first, 1812 would come first. Uh, obviously not chronologically, but I mean, 1812 is three stories. It's the Niagara campaign. It's the Baltimore, Washington. It's the Battle of New Orleans. So there's, that's an epic story, even though my publisher doesn't think so. Um, but that's a three-section book that I think would be pretty good. The French and Indian War, uh, I cover a little bit in my first book on the Revolution, Rise to Rebellion, because George Washington, who's a character in that book, starts the war. A lot of, I mean, that's not a myth. George Washington starts the French and Indian War, um, but he makes a kind of a dumb mistake. And, uh, you know, that's kind of a cool story. That's not really a whole book. You have to, I mean, there's Braddock, and there's all kinds of other things, uh, you know, Fort Pitt and, and all of that. All I can say right now is maybe. All right. Well, Jeff, thank you. It's been a real pleasure getting the opportunity to uh, chat with you once again, and I'm looking forward to finishing the book. Well, thank you. I appreciate everybody tuning in. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to, to jump in here and say uh, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Tim, for, for coming out and um, educating our, our listeners on your, on your new book. Uh, it is To Wake the Giant. Um, if you want to purchase a copy, just click the green button below. It's right below all of our faces. Um, and just a little inside information here. Uh, me and Jeff were talking earlier. Uh, we have at the bookstore here first edition, first printings. The book is officially published tomorrow. But, Jeff, you were saying the first printings have already sold out. So yeah, it's already on its second printing. It's already in its second printing, which is that's only happened to me once before. So that that holds well for the book. Yeah, so it's it's incredible. incredible. It's incredible. It's it's awesome. So congratulations on the book. Even during a pandemic, your books are selling and they're they're bestsellers. So uh, congrats again. Um, thank you again, viewers. Um, and I'll give you Jeff and Tim. I'll give you the last word. Uh, uh, anybody who has anything they want to say to me or want to write a letter, or make a comment. And as I say in my website, even the grumpy ones, that, that's okay. Write to my website. I mean, I, I answer every email and, uh, you know, it may take me a little time, but I'm happy to talk to anybody. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for sticking around and sitting through this conversation. Uh, I, I love history and I enjoyed it and I hope you did too. So thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. See you guys. Good night. Good night.